of the God whose potential is yet to be known. There is no limit as to what God can do. So just keep on praying, he's listening to you. Amen. Wasn't that good? Reminds me of a passage of scripture in Hebrews 4 where it says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. Why? Because we have a great high priest, amen, whoever liveth to make intercession for us. Um, well, it is a pleasure and a blessing to be here with you all this evening. My name is Chase Rooks, like Pastor Bowman mentioned, and I'm originally from Fort Scott, Kansas, um, out in the, the boonies there um, in the Midwest. Uh, my father is a pastor of Grace Baptist Church there in Fort Scott, and um, they were actually just finishing up their missions conference today, so just a week behind you all. But um, I am finishing up my last semester at Crown College right now uh, in the master's program studying missions, and the Lord's really burdened my heart for missions. So this morning I was walking in, I saw all the, the flags and all the banners and everything, and my heart was just so stirred. Um, there's such a great need everywhere for the gospel, is there not? Yeah. And, um, you know... Some people say, well, this, this place, there's a greater need than this other place. But no, my friend, there's a, there's a need everywhere for the gospel. And the, the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ is for all the world. Um, and so let us labor together with him. Amen? Amen? Well, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to take the word of God with me and open up to the gospel according to Matthew. The gospel according to Matthew, chapter 20. It's where we'll be reading our text for this evening. And um, this is a passage of scripture that the Lord has been using a lot in my own life personally. And I'll explain a little bit more about that a little later. But if you have your Bibles there and open up in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 20, we'll begin reading in verse number 29. And the Word of God says, And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still, and called them, and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them, and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer, please? Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come into thy presence again, we thank you, just like the song says, for what great things thou hast done. Lord, we thank you first and foremost for thy son, and for his death on the cross, Lord, for if it had not been his death in our place, where would we be, Lord? We'd have to deal with our sin on our own, Lord. We'd, we'd be living in the middle of who knows where, doing who knows what. But because of a God who was moved with compassion, Lord, upon this lost and dying world, and when you looked on us, Lord, you were moved with compassion. You sent your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus, to take our place on the cross, Lord, to bear our sin and our shame. And through your death, Lord, thy burial and thy resurrection, Lord, we have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And we thank you so much for the freedom and the privilege that we have by thy spirit to be able to come before thee. 
Lord, truly, like thy word says, may we come boldly into thy presence, not because of who we are, but because what thou hast done, and thou alone, and because thou art not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but you are well acquainted with our grief, for thou thyself art called a man of sorrows. And Lord, I pray that you would please help us to sorrow with you over this lost and dying world. Lord, may our prayer tonight be as these blind men, open our eyes, God, that we may see thee, Lord, please remove all distractions, bind the devil, for he walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, even Christians in this room this evening. Lord, I pray that you would please remove me out of the way. May I just simply be a mouthpiece, and may your word speak to our hearts, Lord. Speak to my heart, I pray thee, this evening. And I pray that most importantly, that thou, Lord Jesus, would be glorified. For thy word says, if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men into thee. And so I pray, Lord, that the falling down of thy spirit would come now upon us as we open thy word. And may you humble us and help us to hear from thee tonight. For we need thee and thee alone. We ask it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank him and pray. Amen. Amen. In our passage of scripture here this evening, we see that um, just as we heard this morning, we heard about um, uh, the Lord Jesus speaking about the, the great need of listening and hearing. But tonight, um, we're going to be speaking about uh, seeing and the blind. And as we notice in this passage of Scripture, there are these two blind men that are on the wayside uh, from Jericho to Jerusalem. And um, in this record of Scripture is actually uh, close to the end of the Lord's earthly ministry. If you read on, um, they're traveling to Jerusalem for the last time. That next time they go into Jerusalem, Christ is going to be riding on a donkey. And it will be this triumphal entry. And many of these people, this multitude that have been following him, will be saying, Hail to the, the Son of David. But what's interesting is that although many people passed through this, this way before, they failed to notice these two blind men that were sitting helpless on the side of the road, probably begging because they had no means to support themselves. And no one noticed them. They were just sitting there by themselves. And tonight, I'd like for us to examine this great need uh, found in verse number 33, where the Word of God says, that our eyes may be opened. That our eyes may be opened. Do you realize that we are living in a great age, a very wonderful age. Some people call it the technological age, all this technology with iPhones, iPads, every other eye device there possibly is, right? But we're living in another age, an age of spiritual darkness, an age of spiritual blindness. If you look around in the world today, you can see it, even in our own nation. Um, I was, uh, had the privilege of staying with the Browns this, um, this weekend, and uh, Brother uh, Brown and I were talking last night, and he was telling me something that completely shocked me about how, I think it was, you said, nine counties in the state of Alabama that doesn't have a, a, a local independent uh, Baptist church. Nine counties in the state of Alabama. That's in the United States of America. The Christian nation. May God help us to see that we are no longer living in the glory days, as it were, of the past. But we are living in a dark world. A dark world. And they are blinded. If you talk to people today, the common theme of today is, well, I'm okay. I'm okay. As long as you don't bother me. I, you know, you can have your religion, whatever you would like, but as long as you don't, as long as you don't bother me with that, I'm okay. The, age, though, the word of the age is tolerance. You accept what everyone else believes, as long as you don't encroach that upon other people, then it's fine. But do we realize that there is a dividing factor, and that is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, that says all men are sinners, whether or not you like to believe it. And may God help us to be reminded that we are only sinners saved by His marvelous grace. We are no better than any of the lost in this world. And so as we approach this passage of Scripture this evening, I'd like for us to examine the subject of spiritual blindness. But before we dive into the passage itself, I'd like for you to um, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 26. Acts, chapter 26. The Apostle Paul, the Lord greatly used as a missionary to the Gentile people. And if it weren't for him, we probably wouldn't be here this evening. And praise God for that. But in Acts, chapter 26... Um, we find uh, the Apostle Paul giving an account of his salvation, his conversion. 
Um, and in this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul reveals a little bit more about what the Lord specifically told him on that day in the road to Damascus. But I find it very interesting, um, something that the Lord Jesus himself spoke to the Apostle Paul. And we'll begin in verse number 15. And I, this is Paul speaking, said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Now notice this next expression, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Notice this other expression in verse number 18. It says, from the power of Satan unto God. Even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself said the fact that we have a powerful enemy and he has great power and he's blinding the minds of those that believe not. If you'll turn over into um, the second epistle to the Corinthians, chapter number 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we see a similar thing the Apostle Paul is giving here. Is charged to this carnal church. In verse number 1, it says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. In verse number 2, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians, it says, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That word in verse number three, that means hid, it means concealed. It means they can't see it. It's like a veil that's put over it. It is blocking the truth. It's blocking the light. It's like, for example, as um, Christ mentioned in the gospel records, if you had the, the light and you put it under a, a, uh, a bushel, you cannot see the light anymore. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I wonder this evening, do people know that you are a Christian, that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? Can they tell by your actions? You know what's extremely convicting? In the gospel according to Matthew again, um, in uh, chapter number 23, um, the Lord Jesus Christ, whenever he came into the temple, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, they came and they approached him. They began to ask him all these questions to try to trip him up. Um, he, had entered, he had just entered in uh, triumphantly into Jerusalem, and uh, many of the people were saying, Hosanna. And he came into the temple and he overthrew the money changers. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they said, we have to stop. We have to get this man to stop. We have to catch him at something. So they began to ask him a series of questions. Then after that, the Lord begins to give a very scathing sermon against the Pharisees. And there's something that's very convicting I'd like to draw your attention to in uh, beginning verse number 1 of Matthew 23. The Bible says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. The Lord Jesus had nothing wrong or against what the Pharisees were saying for people to do, what they were teaching, what they claimed to believe in. But notice what the next part says. It says, verse number three, But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. You know, I believe that we're meeting in a, in a wonderful uh, assembly here this evening that preaches the word of God. But do we really live what we believe? Do we really live what we believe? There is a lost and a dying world. And if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. We should not be in this room except by the grace of God. We could be out there on the streets, lost and dying and on our way to hell. And if someone hadn't come by us and knocked on our door and told us about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for our sins, where would we be? So how selfish and how hypocritical are we, am I, if we say something and we live the exact opposite? If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. But as we examine our portion of Scripture this evening, in Matthew chapter 20, again, if you'll turn back over there with me, we see that 
there's three main different characters in this story. These two blind men, the multitude, and our Lord. And let's examine, first of all, the cry of these blind men. What was it that they were saying? Notice again in verse number 30, it says, Behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside. It was interesting, Pastor preached on this morning about the different grounds. These were literally by the wayside. You know, there's people in a parable that the Lord gave. He said, go out into the highways and hedges. Compel them to come in. There are people all around us that are on the wayside that we pass every day. But notice it says, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, have mercy on us. Notice, this is what they pleaded for. They didn't plead for grace. They pleaded for mercy. They understood where they were. They understood their helpless condition. They understood the fact that there was nothing that they could do to give themselves sight. That they were in a state where they could do nothing without some intervention, some divine hand upon their life. Have mercy. Have mercy. We were called of the the prayer of the prophet Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter 3 where he says, In wrath, remember mercy. Oh, that God would be merciful to us. But notice also what it says here. It says, Have mercy on us, O Lord. O Lord. You know, Lord is a, a word that is used as far as a, a servant has towards his master. And in those days, they, uh, the, the Romans would uh, own soldiers and um, own different servants that could serve them. And they, uh, they did their, di- their bidding and those different things with them. But the relationship between the master and the servant was that the servant always did what the master desired. That was the one purpose of the servant, was to be obedient to his master. But notice they said, oh Lord, oh Lord. They recognized that Jesus was not just a man, but he was God himself. Notice it says, thou son of David. We won't take the time to go into it this evening, but I encourage you, whenever you have a chance to um, read in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 is when David is um, very burdened about building a house for the Lord. He's burdened about building a temple for God. And it is during that passage of Scripture where God makes a covenant with David that he will establish the throne of David forever. And it's through that passage of Scripture where we find that Christ and his earthly kingdom, his millennial reign, is eventually is, uh, promised. But this is why it was so important, because he was the son of David. Not just a son of David, he was thou son of David. O oh Lord, thou son of David. They recognized who he was. And they cried out for him. Something important I'd like for you to notice about the the cry of the blind men is that they saw their need, but they couldn't see the answer. Their physical blindness hindered them from seeing the Lord. And although they saw their need of him, they could not see him. They cried out for mercy. And you know, there are still millions in this world who are crying out, Our Lord Jesus Christ said himself in Matthew chapter 9, he said, Truly the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Do we really believe that there is a plenteous harvest that is still out there? God is still on the throne, and he's seeking the lost to bring into himself. But he needs laborers. He needs those who will willingly go and give themselves to labor with him, to bring them in. If you... um, Notice with us, secondly, this evening, not only the cry of the blind men, but also the reaction of the crowd. The reaction of the crowd. Verse number 31, it says, And the multitude rebuked them, because they should hold their peace. The multitude rebuked them. Now these were the followers of the Lord Jesus. They were, these were those that had been with him. Those that were supposed to, supposedly, have been following his teaching. But notice, says they rebuked him. That word rebuke means to tax with fault, to chide. It's your fault. Get out of here. Leave us alone. You're disturbing the master. He's trying to teach. You're no good. Why are you here? But I wonder this evening, how many people do we pass every single day that are not our stereotypical churchgoers who are maybe the drug addicts or maybe those who come from rough backgrounds Maybe those who have fallen into some wicked sin. I don't know what the case may be. But what is our reaction 
Do we fall into the category with this crowd? Do we rebuke those from coming to the Lord, from crying out to Him, having mercy? May God help us. May God help us to see our need of getting out of the way and bringing others to the Lord. And notice something particular about this crowd. Although the blind men saw their need, but they couldn't see the answer, they saw the answer, but they didn't see their need. They didn't see their need. You know, there's um, a, a part of the scripture here uh, earlier on in the Gospel according to Matthew, whenever the Lord tells his, these multitude that are following him, you didn't come because you wanted to see miracles, you just came because I fed you. And how often are we like that? We just come because of what God does for us, not because of who he is. May God help us to love and to serve the Lord because of who he is, not necessarily because of a work or because of some experience. You know, something that the Lord has really convicted me about personally in my own life is that it is so easy to make an idol of an experience with God rather than simply loving God himself. You know, and to testify with that with Scripture, if you remember in the book of Numbers, the Lord brought fiery serpents into the camp of the children of Israel. And what, what did God command Moses to do? He said, go, and I want you to build a brazen serpent upon an, uh, a, a pole, and whosoever looks upon it shall be saved, shall, shall be healed. But if you look later on into the reign of King Hezekiah, hundreds of years later, they tore down that brazen serpent because they were burning incense into it. Because that very thing that God used to deliver them, that experience that they had, became an idol. Became a stumbling block. God help us because we are living in a world that has no fixed standard. We live our life based on our feelings. Well, I don't feel like going to church today, so I guess I just won't go. <laughs> I wish I could do that with my class, but unfortunately I can't. <laughs> but... We need the fixed standard. And you know what the fixed standard is? It's God's word right here. And if we're not in it every single day, then how can we know the one that we're supposed to tell about? Our hearts have grown so cold and so hardened. We don't have a desire for the lost to come in. We're like that multitude. And say, no, don't disturb us. We've got our lifestyle. We've got our church. We've, everything's going all right. And then you just had to come in and interrupt everything. We we're perfectly comfortable. But God, help us, deliver us from this comfortable Christianity. Was it comfortable when the Lord Jesus went to the cross and bled and died for you? There was no pillow on the cross. He bled and died. He laid down his life for us. And how often are we so inconvenienced by people? May God help us to see our need to see what we really need in our life. We need Jesus Christ. We need Him. You know, it was very interesting. I work at um, Chick-fil-A back in Tennessee. And the Lord has really burdened my heart for the people there. And um, the other day, I was uh, working in the back with a couple other employees. And one of them, I know, um, claims to be a, an agnostic. And I've tried to witness and share the gospel to him before. Um, and then there was another young lady who was back there, and she claims to be a Christian. And at one point, uh, the young lady made a comment about how she didn't really get upset over anything, and she, you know, pretty much, you know, got along with everyone. And so the agnostic employee made a comment about how, well, what about terrorists? Do you like those people? And she made a comment, well, I, I guess I wouldn't have anything, you know, I wouldn't like them, but I don't hate them, that type of thing. And so... Observing the conversation, I made a statement about, well, you know, God loves all people, and so we can love all people because he loves all people. And I'll never forget, the Lord convicted me so much of this, is that the agnostic employee immediately said no. And that's all he said. But the Lord so convicted me because if he's so quick to believe that there's no one in this world that truly loves all people, then obviously he hasn't seen that love in my life. Obviously he hasn't seen that love in the other employees that claim to be Christians. May God help us. Do we really love all people? All people. The homosexuals, the terrorists, those that are completely against our lifestyle. The Lord Je Jesus died for them. He died for all people. And all throughout the Word of God, it says, whosoever will may come. 
Who are we to put a limitation or a hindrance on the Gospel? But as we were allowed of God, the Bible says, to be put in trust with the Gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing God. May God help us to please Him and Him alone. Oh, may we give the Gospel to everyone, to all creatures, to every man. We all need the Gospel. But too many times, like this crowd, we follow along, just following everyone else that goes along, instead of really following Jesus. Are you following the crowd, or are you following Jesus? Who are you following this evening? But not only the cry of the blind men, the reaction of the crowd, but thirdly this evening, the compassion of the Lord. Amen. The compassion of the Lord. Notice in verse number 32, it says, And Jesus stood still and called them. You know, it's interesting. When the multitude rebuked the blind men for crying out for the Lord, the Lord stood still. He stopped what he was doing. We realize that we can be so enamored and busy in our life, just like Pastor talked about this morning, that we crowd out the Lord and what he wants to do in the lives of others. The Lord Jesus stood still. He stood still and saw the need of these people. Are you standing still? Have you stopped today and just thought about those who were at the restaurant that you went to this for lunch today? What about your neighbors across the street that were cutting down those trees? What about those who were driving by you and cut you off as you were trying to get on the interstate? God loves all people. And the Lord stood still. He stood still. And you recall whenever he went and went to the mountain right before his crucifixion, he wept over Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. His heart broke for the people. And may God help us, may God help me to let my heart break. Oftentimes, we are too busy to notice this lost world around us. We crowd everything else out. And you know what? That busyness is not limited to outside things. But it can be even in God's work. Did you realize that we can be so busy doing things for the Lord that we forget the one thing that is most needful? It's just like Mary and Martha, was it not? Martha was so busy. She's got to get everything ready. She's working. She's cooking. You know, she's frying the eggs. She's doing everything. She's got it all ready. And she's about to lose her head. She looks over there, and there's Mary. And she's just sitting there doing nothing. She says, Lord, dost thou not care that thou hast left me to serve alone? And what did the Lord say? He said, Martha, Martha, Mary hath chosen that good thing that cannot be taken away from her. You know, what's interesting is that Martha, even though she was busy serving the Lord, she got so busy that she forgot the Lord cared. Dost thou not care? I wonder, I don't know what everyone's going through this evening, but some of us are probably discouraged. I don't know what you're all facing, but Jesus still cares. Amen. Just get some time alone with him. And just get on your face and say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me to see my need of you. But notice also, he says here in verse number 34, or verse 33, it says, They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. The Lord asks them, what, what would you have that I do unto you? And they say, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. I find it interesting here. It does not say that they wanted to be able to see. Do you notice that? It says, that our eyes may be opened. That our eyes may be opened. You know, it's very interesting. It's the exact same word that the Lord Jesus himself used in Acts 26 about opening the eyes of those that are spiritually blind. And I believe truly these blind men saw their spiritual need of the Lord. And that's what moved the Lord with such compassion. They didn't just want something from Him, but they wanted Him Himself. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to be with Him. Notice even in verse 34 at the end of it, it says, Immediately their eyes received sight. And what, what did they do? They followed Him. Amen. They followed Him. That's, that's the only reason they wanted their eyes open. So that they could follow Jesus Christ. But notice it said that Jesus had compassion on them. Jesus had compassion on them. Well, as the blind men, they saw their need, but they couldn't see the answer. 
And the multitude saw the answer, but they didn't see their need. The Lord saw their need and acted in love and compassion. He acted in love and compassion. Jude 22, we're all familiar with it. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Did you know the word compassion is the complete opposite of, of pity? Compassion means driving to action. You are so compelled with emotion and love for that person that you cannot help but do something. And that's what the Lord Jesus did. But do we really have compassion on the lost? You know where true compassion comes from? It comes from being with Jesus. It comes from being with Jesus. So you want to know why this world does not sense compassion? It's because his children are not being with Jesus. You know, in the Gospel according to Mark, in chapter number 3, we're all called to different things, in a sense. So the Lord might have us to be maybe in the ministry full-time as a pastor or preacher or evangelist, missionary, a teacher, or might be a, an employee or someplace. But every single person that names the name of Christ are first called to something else. And in Mark chapter 3, in verse number 13, it says, And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve, notice this, that they should be with him. Amen. That they should be with him. You know, the Lord has really been working hard on my life to try to bring me to this point. Um, this past year and a half has been kind of a challenging one for me. Um, I finished up my undergraduate, and I had the privilege of serving in England for a while. Um, worked at a camp in Texas. It was a wonderful time. And then came back from my master's. But it was very difficult, very difficult. Um, and I know I probably shouldn't have acted in some of the ways that I did. But something that I believe the Lord has been bringing me to through all of it is that the Christian life is not about what you do. It's not about where you go, but it's about who you're with. The Christian life is not about what you do. It's not about where you go, but it's about who you're with. It's about the fact that we're with Jesus Christ. We're with Jesus Christ. His Spirit is with us even now. Jesus is with us here in this meeting. God, help us to see this. That it is God Himself with us. The Lord said to his disciples when they came back rejoicing that they had power over devils, he said, don't rejoice that you have power to cast out demons, but that your names are written in the book of life in heaven. The fact that we're Christians, that God by his mercy reached down when we were just blind men sitting on the wayside and we didn't know what to do or where to go. When God in his mercy looked upon us and reached down with compassion and pulled us up out of the miry clay, and he forgave us our sins, gave us a new name, a new life. Do you realize that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin account. He doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees you as a child of God. Child of God! Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we, wicked, sinful, rotten, wretched, we should be called the sons of God. And we are the sons of God. If you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, Hold on a second now. As the sons of God, may we tremble. Oh, may God help us to tremble at the lost and dying world that is blinded by the devil. If you don't think that there's a spiritual war going on, the devil has got you blinded. May God help us to open our eyes, to help us see our need of Jesus, to, be, to let him be the witness through us. Just one final quick portion here in Romans chapter 5. So you'll turn over there. Romans chapter 5. I love this passage of Scripture so much. But I think this reveals a key, a key to us. Romans chapter 5, it says in verse number 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, notice this, 
much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He wants to save us through his life. He wants to live in our place. Are you spiritually blinded tonight? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Or as a Christian, have your eyes waxed dull to the Lord? I believe it was G. Campbell Morgan that made a comment in a message that he preached. And he talked about how that no one can, tr if the person who comes to the cross thinks that they've fully analyzed it, either they are a fool or their eyes have grown blind. May we never lose the wonder of the cross. May God help us to see our need of him this evening.